Greetings. My name is Seth Murray. I'm a priest in the Old Catholic Communion of North America. And my purpose here today is to present, present to you a paper that I wrote a few years ago. Having to do with uh, the title thereof is, Is There One True Church, One True Faith? The purpose of this paper is to address a common controversial question by providing facts about the origin and early development of the Christian Church. And your comments are welcome. Many people claim today that Jesus started one church, mine is it and yours is not. However, claiming that something is the case and it actually being the case are two very different things. Jesus commissioned his disciples and especially the apostles and their successors to continue his ministry. Though they met in different distinct communities with different languages and customs, they shared the same faith in Jesus and are collectively called many things, the family of God a flock or sheepfold, the body of Christ, the people of God, a chosen people, the bride of Christ, a royal priesthood, and simply the church. The apostles and disciples started or otherwise supported many early Christian communities, training them in the faith and choosing deacons, priests, and bishops from among them to continue to lead the individual churches. The apostles then moved on to the next community which needed their help but often wrote letters back to those they had already visited or started. Some of these letters make up our Christian New Testament. Jesus and the church he started are present in the world in different ways. Wherever Jesus is, wherever someone is genuinely attempting to carry out his ministry, there is the church. The more fully we are united with Christ, preaching the gospel message of the kingdom and living that in faith, the more the one holy Catholic and apostolic church is present in the world. The church experienced unfortunate stresses and divisions from the very beginning. Nonetheless, many discrete, particular churches existing today can rightly trace their existence, origin, and practices to Jesus via the apostles and their successors. This is especially true of the churches commonly called Orthodox or Roman Catholic. This also appears to be true of some Anglican, Old Catholic, and similar churches, insofar as they have maintained authentic apostolic succession. This is true in a different way of many churches called Protestant, Evangelical, non-denominational, and similar. For even communities which lack true ap apostolic succession are united to Christ via authentic baptism and their faithful living and preaching of the gospel. Some individuals and groups so deviated from the authentic historical, historical Christian message that they are not correctly called Christian, nor are they a formal part of the Christian church. Finally, the evidence does not support the assertion made by some that their particular church is, in an exclusive sense, the one true church started by Christ. Rather, there are many communities which can reasonably, reasonably claim to trace their existence to Jesus via the apostles and their successors. All who are baptized into Christ and are faithfully committed to a life in Christ Jesus are members and expressions of the true body of Christ the Church. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And all were made to drink of the one spirit. <clears throat> it is hard enough to be a Christian in today's world. There's no need to make it more complicated or difficult. And there's no need to create and perpetuate divisions. One of the confounding difficulties for those considering Christianity or already struggling in their faith is the many competing and conflicting claims that people make about Jesus, the Christian Church, and how we relate to these today. For example, some Roman Catholics and Orthodox adamantly assert that their church, as it exists today, is the one true church started by Jesus 2,000 years ago. Others claim that Christianity became so co-opted in the first decades and centuries, but that their practice today is a return to the simplicity and purity of early Christianity, 
whereas things like Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy are, quote, religions of men, end quote. Yet others claim that any Christian church, insofar as it truly seeks Jesus, is equally authentic, even if they have radically different beliefs, practices, and so on. Some even claim that church and religion in general is a waste of time, or that God can be found anywhere and all spiritual pursuits are equivalent. This article looks to the historical evidence so as to discern the reality regarding the church started by Jesus, as well as how that is or is not present today. In this we won't be looking at Christianity relative to other religions, but just considering the development of Christianity itself. We will also keep in mind a principle suggested by St. Vincent of Lorenz. Moreover, in the Catholic Church itself, all possible care must be taken that we hold that faith which has been believed everywhere, always, by all, for that is truly and in the strictest sense Catholic, which as the name itself and the reason of things declare comprehends all universally. This rule we shall observe if we follow universality, antiquity, and consent. We shall follow universality if we confess that one faith to be true which the whole church throughout the world confesses. Antiquity, if we in no wise depart from those interpretations which it is manifest were notoriously held by our holy ancestors and fathers. Consent, in like manner, if in, an, in antiquity itself we adhere to the consentient definitions and determinations of all, or at least of almost all priests and doctors. Now we hold that those in the first centuries nearest to Christ and the apostles probably knew more clearly what Jesus intended for and meant by the church. This isn't to say that there can't be development in that understanding. But this suggests two sensible principles. One, if some doctrine was widely held to be true and necessary from the earliest known moments, then it seems it should still be held as doctrine today, unless it can be shown that it was an error, a misunderstanding, or circumstances have so changed that it's no longer true or relevant. Two, if something was not widely held to be necessary doctrine, in the first centuries of Christianity, then it seems it should not be a required belief today. These are general guides. Do not preclude development and understanding or adaptation to new situations, nor does this mean that everything that the early Christians believed is correct, or that whatever was believed first or widely must be automatically and uncritically accepted as true. The First Decades of Christianity Jesus instructed his followers, disciples, and especially apostles to go into all the world and minister, teach, preach, forgive, and baptize, to build the church, his church. The leaders lacked fancy degrees, wealth, and book deals. Their sandals sufficed for transportation. This church had no building, no budget, no corporate charter, no worship band or hip youth ministry program. The New Testament authors referred to this movement simply as the Church, and sometimes the Church of God. This upstart group didn't emerge in a religious vacuum. At the time of Jesus, the primary regional religious expressions were, for the Jews, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, and the synagogues in various towns. The Greek and Roman cultures in which they had lived also had religious expressions, temples for various deities, small corners and personal homes dedicated to the local gods. Statues around various towns. Many of the earliest Christians, being primarily Jewish, gathered in the Jewish temple and synagogues. Many Jews converted to Christianity this way, but the message of Christ was also rejected by much of the synagogue and temple leadership, leading to the Christians no longer being welcomed there. Further, the temple was destroyed by the Romans around 70 A.D., eliminating it as a meeting place for Christians. However, the Christian church continued to grow through both Jewish converts as well as extension into other nations and cultures, for example, the Greeks, Romans, and others. But what does this mean to build or to be a part of a church, part of the church? 
Today, one might answer that it involves constructing a building, establishing programs and committees, and hiring a preacher. But this isn't what Jesus was talking about, and it isn't what his followers did. What they built was a community of people, a community of communities, united by their shared faith in the message and person of Jesus, including their attempts to support each other in applying Christ's teachings in their daily lives. We saw this in the readings just from the from Acts today, after the initial conversion after Pentecost. It suggests or asks, what did what did these early Christians do? What well, says they they gathered together for prayer, or they devoted themselves to prayer, to the teachings of the apostles as they come to us through Christ, and to the breaking of the bread, which was a term that referred to the Eucharist or the commemoration of the Last Supper, when they would gather together as families and friends and celebrate a meal together. And then in the midst of that meal, uh, the priests or elders would say a special blessing over some bread and wine, which they would then share. Now, Christians don't believe or teach that this was merely or purely a human activity, but that God was and is present in a special way, guiding and giving life to their efforts. This presence is generally called the Holy Spirit, and the book of Acts records the event in which the Spirit came upon the church in a new and powerful way. Of course, this doesn't mean that everything that these people did was perfect or without error. God is present in and guides the church, as well as individual Christians, but the church is also very, very human. Contemporary churches often have hundreds or thousands of members, but in early Christianity, each individual community usually consisted of just one or more extended families. Some of their friends and neighbors, and ranged in size from about a dozen to several dozen people, they met in private homes, usually on Sundays. Each ideally had one or more priests, presbyteroi, and sometimes one or more deacons. Priests led the worship services, and deacons generally assisted. Ancient records suggest that the services were simple. They prayed to God, discussed Jesus' teachings, perhaps reading a letter from one of the apostles. They shared a meal together, and in the midst of this meal the priests would offer a special prayer over the bread and wine, in keeping with Christ's words at the Last Supper. The Christians believed that the blessed, consecrated bread and wine were no longer just food for the body, but Jesus was present in a powerful and unique way in them, making them food for the soul. They consumed this Eucharist, or communion, offered some more prayers or hymns, and then departed. Any extra Eucharist was taken to the sick or homebound. Each of these little communities was considered a part of, and a manifestation of, the church that Jesus told the apostles and disciples to go build, akin to a brick in a building or a cell or organ of the body. They each had individual identities, but were also part of something greater, larger. To address these by letter, the writer might refer to the church in Galatia. This could refer to all of the little house communities in that region. They might share the letter among themselves. The author might also refer to the home church of the Smiths, something like that, to refer to a single community. The structure gradually emerges. As the communities grew and more were added in the decades past, the prayers and actions became more formalized and the larger meal became a separate event, often held after the worship service, sometimes are similar to the potlucks that many churches have today after their worship services. They organize their efforts and relationships with each other. One of the more experienced, respected priests might be selected or consecrated to oversee several priests in several home church communities. Such an overseeing priest was called a bishop or episcopoi. And the collection of communities he managed was called a diocese. Private homes gradually became transformed and increasingly dedicated as churches. As this process continued and more bishops were in a region, they also appointed a head bishop to help organize all the church efforts in that region. 
This was typically the respected bishop of a nearest large city, and he was called the Metropolitan, Archbishop or Primate. The bishop above these, responsible for a larger region, sometimes spanning one or more countries, was called a patriarch, and in some places a pope. These distinctions among bishops, archbishops, etc., are somewhat arbitrary and disciplinary. Even the distinction between bishop and priest is not completely clear from Scripture alone. All bishops are priests. Even the apostles refer to themselves as priests or elders, and every bishop is, in a sense, equal in that he is a successor to the apostles, and every bishop was considered a representative or vicar of Christ. Whether a bishop has any authority over other bishops is just a matter of human organization. Indeed, sadly, the apostles themselves frequently argued about which of them was greater, and Jesus consistently chastised them for such behavior and attitudes. Over the first few centuries, five major Christian geographical regions developed, centered upon five historical central churches, Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. These are sometimes called patriarchates, sees, or even just churches in their own right, for example, the Church of Alexandria or the Church of Rome. Each patriarchate had many dioceses in its boundaries, with each diocese having several individual church communities, usually at least one bishop. Here's a popular available map that shows some of these. I forget which century this is estimated from, but we have Rome up here on the left in Europe and Italy, the Patriarchate of Rome or the Sea of Rome. In this region we have Constantinople, of course the Mediterranean Sea ranging through here. On the right we have Antioch, and the little pink spot here in the middle as Jerusalem, and then in the lower part here, Alexandria in uh, northern Africa. All of these different communities and cultures were united in their shared faith in Jesus and his teachings. The technical or theological term for this is in communion. That is, they believed that they all participated in and shared in one Eucharist in their worship services, and that they were all members of the same body of Christ. Differences of language, race, and culture, in addition to pride and other sins, sometimes made unity a challenge, and it led to misunderstandings and quarrels. However, in principle, any believing, practicing Christian was welcome to participate with and receive communion at any of these communities. The various patriarchates were usually in communion with each other, but also operated with relative autonomy. Each basically saw to its own needs and didn't intrude into other patriarchate circumstances without an invitation to do so. When a question or difficulty arose that seemed to span multiple patriarchates, or was new or overwhelming to a specific patriarch, he might consult with his brother patriarch for advice or even among the bishops in his own his own see in this process a kind of informal ranking arose among the patriarchates the sense grew and was gradually embraced that the patriarch of rome had a primacy relative to the others though constantinople was considered a close second and sometimes rallied for first what this meant in the early centuries of the church was that the patriarch of rome today commonly called the pope was considered not exactly the head or ruler of the entire church, but when it came to matters that concerned the entire church, he was considered a kind of greatest among equals, or to employ a contemporary concept, a respected honorary chairman of the board, or a big brother. It is about here that Roman Catholic apologists chime in with something along the lines of, sure, but any church-wide decision had to be approved by the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. Or they might say, Jesus gave the keys only to Peter. And in this they are correct, kind of. What they conveniently and always leave out is that any church-wide decision not only needed the approval of the Patriarch of Rome, but of every Patriarchate. 
This usually meant including even the various bishops within. Otherwise, it was not considered a valid church-wide decision, but just a regional one, perhaps a smaller synod. From the earliest days, Christian leaders struggled to articulate the faith in a way that was clear and succinct, yet sufficiently comprehensive and avoided misunderstanding. To do so, they wrote and shared creeds or statements of faith. These creeds cannot be treated comprehensively here. We look only to the evolution of the section which talks about the church. Now, in the New Testament, most of which we think was written between about 50 and 90 AD, it generally just speaks of the church, sometimes the church of God, and sometimes a specific church, such as the church of God in Galatia. Christians and the church were also referred to as the flock, as the people of God or house of God, though house of God also traditionally refers to the Jewish temple. It is used in reference to the Christian church in the letter to the Hebrews, likely written after the destruction of the temple. The Didache, likely written in the 1st or 2nd century AD, simply refers to the church without modifiers or qualification. Then there's an old Roman creed. Uh, we don't see this very much. It's kind of a precursor to the Apostles' Creed. In it reads, I believe in, and then we have the Holy Church. So a term has been introduced. The Apostles' Creed, again, we don't know exactly when it was written perhaps between 150 to 250 A.D., among other things, reads, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Then we have the Nicene Creed, which actually has uh, a few versions. The uh, one we recite today is a combination, typically recited today, a combination of a creed from both Nicaea and the Council of Constantinople. And it has a section in it that reads, I believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. So there we have apostolic added and one added. And note the gradual addition of these words, holy Catholic, one, and apostolic to the creed. It's critical to recognize that these are not the names of any church, but ideal qualities or characteristics of the whole church, sometimes called the marks of the church, started by Jesus via the apostles and disciples. None of these communities were then suffering under the delusion that should they label their community, quote, the apostolic church or, quote, the Catholic church, that this meant that only their community was the authentic church and no one else was. That would be crazy. Such delusions would take centuries to get started. Like many theological terms, these attributes of the church can be a bit unclear. Very briefly, the church is called holy because God is in it, and it is constantly in need of holiness because people like you and me are in it. One refers to the idea that though there have tensions and divisions, the church ideally is a place of unity for believers. Like holiness, Christians have often failed to live up to this ideal, but there's the, the ideal of there being one Christ in whom we are to be unified. Apostolic refers to the church's connection to the apostles, their teachings, as well as their continued authority as delegated to and through the bishops. Catholic is an especially confusing term today because presently a segment of the church identifies itself by this word seemingly to the exclusion of others. Strictly speaking, Catholic means encompassing the whole or universal or complete. It's a common term in Latin. When we speak of the church being Catholic, we're saying that everyone is called to be a part of it and loved by it. Irrespective of age, race, culture, abilities, affluence, language, or sex. Around 107 AD, the bishop of the church in Antioch wrote a letter which has the earliest known documented use of the term Catholic in reference to the church. Therein he writes, See that you all follow the bishop, 
even as Jesus Christ does the Father and the Presbytery as you would the Apostles, and reverence the deacons as being the institution of God, let no man do anything connected with the church without the bishop. Let that be deemed a proper Eucharist, which is administered either by the bishop or by one to whom he has entrusted it. Wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the multitude of the people also be. Even as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the universal or Catholic Church. It is not lawful without the bishop either to baptize or to celebrate a love feast, which meant the divine liturgy or the mass, but whatsoever he shall approve of that is also pleasing to God, so that everything that is done may be secure and valid. Wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. That sentence alone, if correct, should humbly silence every person who has ever dared to claim, My Church is the one true Church. For Jesus is clearly present and operating in various ways and degrees by the power of the Holy Spirit in many different distinct Churches. Further, Jesus said that wherever two or three gather in my name, there I am in their midst. In how many places does that happen? When we consider what the church is collectively, it includes all true faithful Christians presently living by faith, all those in the past, and in a sense all those Christians who are yet to be. All of these are united in Christ and make up the body of Christ. Each person is united with Christ in the church and therefore with each other via baptism, and a personal relationship with Christ Jesus that allows God to work in his life by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Dealing with Difficulties, Councils In the early Christian church, the term Catholic referred to a quality of the church as a whole, as well as each of the particular churches, even to individual Christians. They were each and collectively one holy Catholic and apostolic, and considered members of one organization or body, the body of Christ. Unfortunately, difficulties and disputes sometimes arose with and among these individual communities and even among the major sees. If the disagreements were serious, meetings were called among the bishops to attempt to resolve them. These meetings were called synods for smaller gatherings or councils for larger gatherings. The most profound of councils is one to which bishops from the entire church were invited. This is called an ecumenical council. While local synods and smaller councils could address regional issues and establish disciplines for parts of the church, only an ecumenical council could define Christian doctrine for the entire church. The first major council is recorded in the book of Acts in the Bible. It took place in Jerusalem in 48 AD. There was a dispute among the various Christian groups regarding whether non-Jewish, Greek, Roman, etc., converts to Christianity needed to also follow Jewish traditions. The apostles and others gathered to discuss, debate, and pray, and came to a decision which they communicated to the various church communities. The next major ecumenical council didn't take place for nearly 300 years. Over those three centuries, Christianity grew and spread far from Jerusalem. It encountered many different cultures and challenges. It went from meeting in homes and hidden places to becoming a religion that one was allowed to practice publicly. Public gathering places, churches, began to be built. There were difficulties during this period, but they were primarily between Christians in the secular state more than among Christians themselves. In the fourth century, Secular and state suppression of Christianity decreased substantially. In some places it was suddenly fashionable to be Christian. Without being constantly oppressed by the state and with a new influx of converts, Christians began having more problems with their fellow Christians. The Council of Nicaea was called by the Emperor of Constantinople in 325 AD to attempt to address tensions and arguments among Christians regarding Christ's divinity relationship to God the Father, and so on. 
It resulted in the development of the Nicene Creed, later adapted to be the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, today recited in many churches. Though these councils generally resolve controversies, they sometimes also resulted in divisions among genuine Christians. The Council of Chalcedon in the 5th century, for example, ended up with a substantial split or schism, in which several geographical churches, Coptic, Armenian, Syriac, and some others, were no longer in communion with the rest of the Christian church. These are collectively known today as the pre-Chalcedonian Orthodox churches, sometimes also called the Oriental Orthodox. The greater church continued on for roughly 600 more years. Another tremendous split occurred around the 11th century between the Patriarchate of Rome and the other Patriarchates, some of which were already suffering greatly under Islamic invasion and rule. Though this is sometimes said to be over changes made to the creed by Rome, that is the filioque, it really had more to do with an increasing tendency for the Patriarch of Rome to attempt to extend authority over the other Patriarchates, a tendency which would later be defined as papal supremacy as well as other mutual grievances, some spanning centuries. The other patriarchates rejected these attempts, eventually leading to a separation which continues to this day. To distinguish these separated churches from each other, the churches of the Patriarchate of Rome were generally, generally referred to as the Western Roman Latin or Catholic Church. Of course, by calling themselves the Catholic Church, there is an implied attempt to identify themselves exclusively with the early church started by Christ via the apostles. The other patriarchates continued to identify themselves as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church from the Nicene Creed and as orthodox. Orthodox means right belief, which suggests, of course, that anyone else is engaging in wrong belief. The orthodox are also often referred to by their particular geography or heritage, for example, the Greek Orthodox Church. It should just be granted that the Roman Catholic Church won the naming scheme marketing battle here, and people have been confused ever since. Of course, there were later splits and controversies leading to the Protestant evangelical movements, as, <clears throat> as well as the development of the Anglican Church, Old Catholics, and others. There have also been quarrels and frequent divisions among and within various Orthodox churches. And when these divisions occur, the fundamental question is whether the two parties both remain part of the church, yet divided from one another, or has one or both of them actually departed from authentic Christianity. In pretty much every schism, the so-called prevailing or majority party, the one which exercised dominance over the rejected party, claims that the minority ejected party is no longer part of the church, but outside of it. In many cases, the minority party simultaneously claims that it is a larger group which has lost its way and departed from the church. Quote, they left us. It takes considerable objectivity and often some time and distance to be able to discern the truth of the matter, sometimes decades or centuries. Some leading contemporary voices in the Eastern Orthodox Church for example, Bishop Callistos Ware of happy memory, I should say, may his memory be eternal, have recently softened this rhetoric, suggesting we know where the church is, that is, that is us, but we do not know where it is not. This is a nuanced way of saying, you might still be a part of the church, but we aren't entirely sure. <coughs> Historically, the Roman Catholic Church also claimed to be the one true church rather adamantly. But a contemporary and obscure Vatican document, Dominus Jesus, reads that the Eastern Orthodox are also true particular churches, and quote, the Church of Christ is present and operative also in these churches. To sum up, Jesus commissioned the apostles to continue his ministry, to call a people into relationship with God and with each other. This collection of people is known as the Church. The Church has a variety of ideal qualities. These include a unity of belief, oneness, holiness from God, the Holy Spirit, 
and openness and invitation to all people, Catholicity, in a grounding in the teachings of Christ via the apostles and their visible successors, the bishops, that is, and apostolicity. The Church experienced tensions and difficulties from the beginning, and to address these it held councils. Despite efforts to remain united, and often due to politics, egos, and similar among Church leaders, considerable divisions came about. It isn't entirely clear whether the various parties are only separating from each other <clears throat> or, also, or also separating entirely from the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. In many cases, the divided parties could still genuinely trace their existence to Christ via the apostles, and they still held to the teachings of the early Christian church. Many apologists conveniently or ignorantly mistake the terms one holy Catholic and apostolic as fully realized qualities or even names rather than ideals toward which we aspire or once may have had but have since lost. They assign these to their own particular church and withhold them from others. Here's a simple timeline graph of church history per apologists for the Orthodox Church. Note how the image suggests that the Roman Catholic Church splinters away from the real church with only the Orthodox remaining on the straight path. We see on the lower left we have the Old Testament faithful, and then the incarnation of Christ leading to the so-called undivided church from roughly 33 AD, they say until approximately 1054 AD, after which they note a breaking away from the straight line, breaking off and up, which they represent as changes in doctrine. They're representing as changes in doctrine as breaks away from the undivided or this one true church. And they see this break away with the growing power of the papacy leading to and actually prompting Protestantism and Anglicanism and other fractures. To the degree that the Orthodox Church identifies itself with or as a part of the Church of the first millennium, the claim to be unchanged, note we have the unchanged Orthodox Church, is demonstrably false. There were many, many changes in the Church over those first centuries, and there have been since. Orthodox apologists are generally overcritical of changes in other groups while ignoring or justifying their own. This isn't unique to the Orthodox, but they're really harsh about it. Now, some Orthodox timelines present the Roman Catholic Church and subsequent Protestant Evangelical churches as a limb which is actually broken off of the tree of life. This seems to be a hint to Christ's warning about branches which are separated from him to be gathered up and thrown into the fire. And the text here is extremely small, difficult to read and follow, but they basically have at the tree here, and on the, at the base of the tree, they have the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that growing up with different branches growing out, representing the, the different uh, churches throughout the world. But then they show this branch breaking and falling off. And uh, they read here, at least in this brochure, they say, this took place when the Bishop of Rome, who's also known as the Pope, broke off from the true church because he wanted to be the head and started to change elementary teachings of Christ that were forbidden to be changed. Prior to this, the church was united for about a thousand years. And he, he, they go on to say the problems they believe are the filioque, uh, supremacy, and infallibility. And then with all these leaves falling off, they list these as the different various uh, Protestant churches and, and so on. Ang they have Anglicans and their Lutherans and so on. A Catholic version of this chart, you know, not to be outdone, <laughs> a Catholic version of this chart is similar in concept, though not nearly as visually interesting. Uh, the only substantive difference is that the Roman Catholic Church is the straight line to Christ, with the Orthodox and others splintering off. So we still have the branches and splinters. It's just who who is the straight line is, is what's implied here. So here, this one goes top down. At the top we have... AD 33, Jesus Christ founding the Catholic Church, 
it says. Then we've got this straight green line going down through the middle, all the way down here uh, to the present day. And then there are all of these splinters coming off of it. The Judaizers, the Gnostics, Manichaeans, Donatists, Nestorians, so on, so on. Then we've got Greek Orthodox, they say uh, down here, Waldensians, and so on. And then uh, the Lutherans and various, various sects and such splitting off. That's the perspective of whoever developed this chart. Now at this point you, you can already see how when we look at the at the history these charts and these perspectives are kind of one grossly self-serving and two they just don't correctly reflect the history now not to be outdone by colorful or clever graphics the church of christ presents the following chart showing oop, i get it back up here <laughs> presents the following chart uh, showing both the Catholic and Orthodox churches on the path toward doom, but with several other Christian denominations attempting to return to the original faith. So this one has extremely small print all throughout. You have to blow it up really big, but we have the Church of Christ starting here on the upper left with Jesus Christ and staying stable throughout history to today's uh, Church of Christ, which is... Um, because it, many people would consider it a, a denomination that is that has kind of sprung up. Now they say here, early on, and this is a common theory uh, among modern kind of Protestant evangelical denominational movements, they say that early on there was a falling away, a massive falling away. They usually associate this with Roman Catholicism, which we have here, this large red band going down here. Uh, they note the Crusades and other other things. Then they also have the Eastern Orthodox, uh, which they call the Greek Catholics, Eastern Orthodox Catholics as well. Now, interestingly, they show attempts to break away from Rome, some of them apparently faltering, and get back to uh, get back to the Church of Christ. And they. They point these out as the Lutherans, the Episcopal, Episcopalians, Methodists, Congregationalists, Presbyterians, and so on. And there's kind of this loose gathering they have, this idea that they're all going to somehow come back together, maybe some, some portion of them uh, come back together and perhaps, perhaps uh, rejoin, come back together as the Church of Christ. But... Uh, so bad news for the Catholics, for the Roman Catholics and Orthodox. It looks like they are stuck on the way to doom down here in the lower right corner. Now, this is a common tactic among churches that identify themselves as Protestant, Evangelical, non denominational. They claim there was some kind of a great falling away or apostasy early in church history but that there are always a few Christians kind of hiding out so that genuine Christianity could be restored in the present. Now, if there is any reason to the universe, sometimes it seems like that's a big if, what we can know is that all of these positions cannot be simultaneously fully correct. At best, one is correct, though it's entirely possible that all are wrong in some way but which one? Apologists for the various churches assert that Jesus established only one church. That's something that they all agree on. It's kind of funny. Apologists for the various churches assert that Jesus established only one church, not a confused, fractured mess, and that to be saved one must find and be a part of that one true church of Christ. The ancient Christian tradition was that any and every person who receives an authentic baptism became part of the church. Whether he, he ultimately lives that out faithfully is another matter, but apart from a clear and substantive break, he's still a part of the church. Like the prodigal son, he might even wander off and waste the gift of salvation he's been given, but he's still a member of the family, and the father loves him and longs for his return. Let us reconsider St. Ignatius' position that wherever Christ is, 
there is the universal, whole, complete, Catholic Church. Jesus is present in each and every church we've mentioned thus far. In all of these we find prayer, worship, the Christian scriptures, an attempt to follow Christ's teachings, even miracles of healing. In all of these, we find some great examples of holiness and godly love. They differ in how they are connected with or descend from the early Christian church, some doctrines, and the way in which they implement Christianity today. But if Ignatius is correct, then all of these communities are, in a way, at least to some degree, part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, if they hold to the truth of the gospel. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. And for any of these churches to pretend that the others are not part of the church, the body of Christ on earth, is simply wrong. Another way of apprehending this is to recognize that the one holy Catholic and apostolic church started by Jesus via the apostles is present in every person insofar as he has been baptized has a living relationship with the Savior, and is living out Jesus' teachings, especially Jesus' teaching to love God and one another. No particular church has an exclusive claim to this, and therefore has no exclusive claim to be the only church started by Christ. Yes, Jesus started one church. Yes, the Roman Catholic Church can trace its existence to Jesus via the apostles and their successor bishops but so can the Orthodox, and so can many other authentic Christian churches. Consider the analogy of a family. David and Sally get married and start a family, one family. However, generations later, their descendants don't get along with each other. Some won't even talk to the others or attend family events. Some go so, so far as to claim that the others aren't even part of the family anymore. They've been disowned. However, all of their descendants can trace their existence to David and Sally. Each of them has an equal claim to be a descendant of David and Sally. Likewise, the Orthodox, Roman Catholic, and some other churches can trace their existence to Jesus via the apostles, and as such can even claim that they are, in a sense, part or an expression of the one church which Jesus commissioned the apostles to build. However, none of these can rightly claim to be that church which Jesus started to the exclusion of all others. This is the fundamental error that apologists for the genuine, authentic, historical churches make, and it causes tremendous confusion for their followers, division among Christians, and a lot of confusion for the rest of the world. Our desire is to draw closer to that which is true, pure, and good that is, our desire to do this is commendable. But do not be confused by those who erone erroneously believe and claim that they are the only exclusive participants therein. Christianity may have been more united early in history, but today it does not appear that there is any visible one true church. Rather, what we have before us is a fractured landscape of Christian churches which express and manifest Christ's teachings and ministry to varying degrees and with varying amounts of other things mixed in. That is, some are more true than others, and perhaps there is one that is more true than all, though I do not know which one it is. But none can rightly claim to be the only one that is true to Jesus' teachings. All have added to or modified them. All have changed in various ways. Further, all are deficient in some way and to some degree, if only because they embrace flawed people like you and me to themselves. In other words, if you find a perfect, true church and join it, well, you just ruined it. Am I suggesting that all Christian churches are effectively 
equal, and it doesn't really matter where one worships. Well, far from it. The witnesses of Scripture and documents from the first few decades and centuries are fairly clear about what Jesus taught and how that was interpreted and lived out by those closest to him. This doesn't preclude growth in understanding of those teachings nor prudent adaptation to different times, languages, cultures, and circumstances, but we still need to remain true to these basics. Thank you for listening to this reading. I welcome your prayers, comments, and suggestions, and ask that God would bless you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.